All right, so welcome back. We are in the home stretch, less than one hour remaining of uh, this tutorial today. So thank you so much for your um, time today. Uh, so we talked a little bit about, uh, Ted's alluded to adaptive integration. I just wanna dive ever so slightly deeper into that and talk about how we might enable that uh, both in the graphical interface and from um, Python. So here's, here's the idea. So this is, you'll notice earlier we did that, we downloaded a model from ModelDB. It was not completely random. Uh, I did it because I wanted to use this example here. Um, and we ran the model and we generated, uh, so this was the membrane potential over time in one of those experiments that we did earlier today. And you'll notice if you look at this, um, you know, when it's spiking, the state variables, voltage, but presumably all the other ones as well, are changing rapidly. And the only way that we can capture that is if we have a small time step, right? Because otherwise we'll just miss, we'll miss the change entirely. We might miss the spike or we might get a large amount of numerical error. So we have to use a small time step or we won't see them. But down here, in between those bursts for hundreds of milliseconds, which is a long time, for hundreds of milliseconds, state variables are changing very, very slowly. And at least in principle, larger time steps are okay. Ted showed us that if we're doing uh, implicit Euler, uh, we can get away with larger time steps. If we're doing explicit Euler, we would be dangerous because errors could explode. Um, but implicit Euler, we're all good. But how do we know, right? So we'd like, you know, in theory, to get this accurate, because that's what it's about at, at the end of the day. We want an accurate result. We, you know, we could use big time steps if we knew when it was. Um, and we, um, so what do we do? We want to use big time steps when things are changing slowly and small time steps when things are changing quickly because otherwise we'd miss the actual officials entirely. But we don't know when they're going to happen. Um, so we can't just be like magically switch it over. So what do we do? Well, we use math. In particular, we use what's known as variable step integration. The nice thing is inside of Neuron, this is, an e this is a freebie. Uh, so you go to the tools menu. If you're using the graphical interface, you go tools, variable step control, and up pops a dialog box like the one that we have over here, the variable time step dialog box. You'll notice that there's a checkbox for using variable DT. It's not selected. If you hit that checkbox, then it'll use variable DT. What does that mean? It will choose what time step that it thinks it needs at any at every given uh, advance. Am I in the middle of a burst? Well, then I better use a small time step. Am I, uh, am I is everything relatively calm? I'm gonna use a large one. And it's not doing this on the basis of burst or any sort of neurophysiological things. It's just looking at the differential equations and seeing how quickly they're changing. Well, how does it decide how big of a step that it can do? Well, fundamentally, it is built around an assumption of error. I will choose a time step such that I estimate that I will introduce no more than 0.001 error on any variable. Or if I want a different magnitude, you know, so that's uh, maybe I maybe I want a different value. So I use it, you know, instead of 10 to the negative three, I use 10 to the negative four, 10 to the negative six, because I want to be really accurate or Maybe I don't care so much and I use 10 and negative two. Although if you do that, if you go too far in the don't care, you'll run into problems. So all you gotta do, pop up the variable step control if you're using the graphical interface, specify the error tolerance and tell it to go. And just pick the DTs that are gonna give it accurate results to within that error tolerance. That's pretty good. Uh, on the Python side, you can either do this. If you've got the variable step, if you've got the graphical user interface, uh, loaded, you have a function called h.cvode active, and then you can pass in true to enable cvode. 
If you're not using the neuron graphical interface, you don't have this function declared by default, uh, but you can use h.cvode open close parentheses dot active. So capital C, capital V dot active of true. Um, if you are using the graphical interface, there are um, technical reasons as to why you might prefer the top one to the bottom one. If you're not using the graphical interface, it doesn't matter and you can use either. Um, when you're doing this though, the error tolerance is not necessarily, the amount of error that you're interested in uh, is, is not necessarily uniform. And so there's this button here. So you can specify the tolerance by ATOL. So HLCVOD ATOL 10 to the negative three is gonna set the tolerance 10 to the negative three. You pass a different number, it's gonna do that. But fundamentally, there, it's, it's not quite that simple though. Cause if you think about it, if you're talking about voltage, Voltage in an action, during an action position might swing from negative 80 to 40 millivolts. It's quite a large range, over 100 millivolts. And so 10 to the negative three millivolts is pretty small uh, in terms of everything. If on the other hand, you're talking about a gating variable, well, gating variable always, you know, M, H, and N in uh, uh, Hodgkin Huxley, those always live between zero and one. So already, you know, that's they're two orders of magnitude smaller of a range than you'd expect from voltage. Well, that's, uh, that's not so good. So you don't, they, you know, the, the variables and what 0.01 means, whether 0.01 is good or bad, depends on the relative magnitude of the values. And fortunately, we allow you to, neuron allows you to specify that. So graphically, what you can do is you can hit the ATOL scale tool and you don't even have to figure this out. You don't have to figure out, well, this variable changes slowly in small values and this value variable changes over large values. Don't worry about it. So what you can do, you pop up the ATOL scale tool and it pops, you know, so opens the absolute tolerance scale factors dialog. You can hit analysis run and it will go and it will calculate, generate this table, looking at all of the different state variables and basically it will pick scale factors. The first column is the easiest to interpret. It'll pick different scale factors uh, to try and figure out what the, you know, uh, what the actual tolerance should be on a per state basis. So for example, MCA uh, gets a scale factor of one from this run. That means that it will literally use the tolerance of 0.001 as the amount of error that's allowed to occur in that particular state variable. If on the other hand, you know, for voltage gets the scale factor of 10, you know what, it's gonna actually multiply it. So it's not gonna be 0.001, it's gonna lose one of those zeros. It's gonna be 10 times bigger. Um, again, because uh, the range of voltage is bigger. So therefore a change is relatively less important. Um, and so forth and so on. Some of these others change even smaller. Um, uh, some of these others change even smaller um, and this will tell you all of that before. You can also select in here under details and pop up a uh, numerical methods um, dialog box and you can choose the exact solver that you wanna use um, as well. And so there, for various reasons, you, you have the choice, you can use Crank Nicholson, the implicit fix step, CVODE, this comes out of the Sundial suite from um, uh, one of the national labs. There's also DASPK. Uh, Neuron will by default pick whichever one of these is appropriate. There are certain models that uh, CVODE can't handle, and then DASBK is the better algorithm. Uh, it's also out of Sundial Suite. Um, and then, you know, uh, but in general, CVODE is faster if it's available. And no one will do the right thing if you just let it. And so, okay, so here's the deal. So once I have all of this, and I've picked this, and I've said that, hey, look, so I want, to, I want to know how much of it, what is the effect of this? So I can take my model and I can run it using fixed step integration. And so here it is. I ran this model with fixed step integration. I have an error tolerance of 0.001. 
Uh, so, oh, sorry, fixed step integration. So it's sorry, it's it's just dt is one fortieth of a millisecond. It's known as default, and the whole thing runs in nine point four nine seconds. If, on the other hand, I hit that selection that I want to use variable step integration, and I leave the absolute error tolerance uh, as it is, I run it, and it actually runs faster. It's amazing. I've now I've I've now won twice because it it ran faster. So that makes me happy. Uh, but more importantly, I have a constraint on the amount of error that I expect to have introduced. I didn't actually have a constraint um, when I uh, spec was specifying DT, right? I didn't know how much error I was going to introduce. Variable step gives me that power of that precision. And when things are smooth for long time periods, as they are here, um, I'm able to use bigger values of DT. Here, you'll note that I ended at its, the, my last inter, advance that I ever did was four milliseconds long, but I could do that because the state variables had leveled off. That wasn't a problem. Um, but I can't, it's not always going to be the case that variable step gives you faster results. If you're working with networks, in fact, it usually won't because you have these large networks. There's always stuff happening somewhere and it's going to be very particular about making sure it handles the spike times exactly right. Um, but yeah, so don't, don't do variable step integration to make things go faster. Uh, do variable step and I mean, you can try, but do variable step integration to, uh, constrain error. And so fundamentally here, uh, just to zo sort of zoom in on what's happening, uh, when I did the variable step integration for the simulation, it did it in a total of a little over 3000 advances. I can see, I can zoom in on an individual spike, I'm making big steps when I'm away from the spike time, but then it adaptively says, hey, you know what, I need to, I, things are starting to change. I better uh, use smaller and smaller time steps. You see it here in the plot of DT, uh, log plot of DT over time. As soon as things, as soon as we start ramping up for an action potential, uh, DT starts dropping by orders of magnitude. Um, also, additionally, uh, CVOD, mathematically, there's this thing known as a, the order of the integration method has to do with how much error it introduces um, for a given DT. Uh, CVOD starts ramping that up as well uh, whenever things are changing rapidly. So it handles all of this stuff for us automatically. All we had to do is flip the, um, the sign, or flip, the, uh, flip the flag to turn CVOD active to true. Um, so fundamentally, we now looked at a sort of recap here. We've looked at a number of ways of improving accuracy. Uh, we can increase the time resolution. Uh, so if we're using fixed step instead of maybe 0.025, maybe I want 0.01 milliseconds, no problems. We can use variable step, which allows us to explicitly specify error control. Uh, HRCVOD.active always works, um, but if they're using uh, the graph, if you're using the graphical interface, you have CVOD underscore active. You can also make that function available if you load a library called STDLib. Um, you can specify the absolute error tolerance when you're doing that. I mean, you should, otherwise, um, why bother? Uh, the other way that you can increase the accuracy is to just sort of increase the spatial resolution because maybe the variation of membrane potential matters. Um, so you increase the spatial resolution uh, at all the sections by a factor of three. So all the sections are now three times as many segments. Um, so in theory, this should reduce your error. If you do this and you don't see any changes to the, on the level of the behavior that you're expecting, then you're probably small enough and all as well. If on the other hand, you change DT and you make DT smaller, you, you make the atoll error smaller, or you make the number of segments bigger, and now all of a sudden your simulation results look different, then you probably haven't found the case where that everything's converged. You, you know, all of this stuff is true as DT goes to zero in the calculus sense, right? And so if it's not, you know, if you're seeing changes, then you're not close enough to zero. And so then that's an empirical way that you can get an intuition about um, whether or not you need to make changes, um, whether or not your simulation is converged. 
So does anybody have any questions or comments about um, accuracy and uh, adaptive integration? One comment about spatial error. Um, yeah, go ahead. Error attributable to inadequate spatial discretization. Tripling NSEG is really a very powerful way to look for that because the spatial discretization scheme that Neuron uses is the central difference method, which is which has second order precision. So if you uh, if you look at the error and how it varies with the fineness of the spatial grid, that means that if you make the spatial grid three times finer, you're reducing error attributable to the spatial grid by a factor of nine, almost an order of magnitude smaller. Unlike changing DT with fixed step integration, where um, with the... Uh, with the uh, ordinary uh, backwards Euler method, that's first order, okay, with regard to dt. So if you trip, if you triple NSEG, and you really don't see a qualitative change, you really have a very good spatial grid, okay, and you be rest assured that you don't have to change it. You can't, you, you don't have to argue. Well, maybe I didn't make it fine enough, okay. <laughs> 